Welcome to another SC Hub episode for the NBL season. Uh, I'm Barnsley, host of the NRL All-Stars podcast and also here for the SC Hub episodes every couple of weeks for NBL Supercoach. Uh, and as many times this year, we've got DVG on board, defending champion still, Mace. And uh, yeah, hopefully you've had a, a good week this week. It was a lot of uh, movers and shakers, especially in the Hub, which was good to see. <laughs> Uh, I had a much better week this week than I did last week. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, round two, I suffered the uh, dreaded uh, captaincy on Derek Walton Jr. So uh, that was pretty ordinary and uh, had, a, had a massive slide this week. Uh, had a fairly solid score of 430, uh, which was uh, which is really good. It's uh, sort of got me back up in the rankings and sitting overall 1,282. Very nice. How'd you go? Um, I ended up with a 454, um, and I was surprised that that pushed me up to number six. So, That's pretty good start to the season for me. Yeah, uh, I ended good. up. I did Captain Davis, um, and I was pretty big on that as well. I didn't really see much downside for him, uh, and I was never going to get cotton in for this round, guy. Um, I thought it was too expensive, and just for the one week. I just thought that you could get you could get those points, and um, thankfully for me, you didn't go off. So uh, that was probably the biggest thing. I still stuffed up though, so that was why um, probably at the start of the round, I didn't think that I was going to do as well, and even halfway through, even towards the end, I didn't think it was going to be that good because I ended up banking 100k looking towards this week, and I did that by going down to Lap Mayen, who ended up losing his starting job as soon as I traded him in. So uh, where that happened, and um, and Mayen. You know, ended up only getting 29 for the round in a double game week. I was, um, yeah, a little bit dejected because Wardenberg was the guy that I got rid of instead. Um, I, I, you know, moved that trade out and Wardenberg obviously went better and uh, and looks a lot better. So, yeah, there's a lot of movement though this week for a, um, a, a super coach game for NBL. You don't see as much movement because of the scoring and stuff. The variations not there between the scores. I, I felt there was heaps and, um, you know, Troy, who does the um, the editing and, and helps run the hub and everything, does a great job. It deserves a shout out. He is saying that uh, his misses actually went up like eight hundred spots to top fifty or something. Um, so, yeah, a lot of movement this week. Yeah, look, I think I think a lot of that movement's probably attributed to the Magne um, scores. Mm. Um, I think I think Magne was traded in by like. 70% of the top 1%. Um, and, like, it's not like he scored terrible, terrible, terrible. But for the price point, um, you know, obviously everyone needed and expected more. Um, you know, especially the fact that he's not on a double game week this week. We know he's on a double game week next week. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people made moves to put him out, you know, put other good pieces out and put him in. And then on top of the 73%, um, I'm pretty sure a pretty good portion put the captain on him, just getting that uh, up now. But I'm pretty sure you'll find mm. there's a pretty healthy, um, there's a pretty healthy whack of people that were, that had captained him. Yeah. Of the top 1%, 60% had captained him. Um, yeah, that's where the movement is because that's massive in the top. Yeah. Absolutely, it's huge. It's a, it's huge. So for him to have gone to where he did, where he sort of did, at that price point, that's where I think because of that ownership was so huge. Uh, I think that's basically where, where it all came out. So um, yeah, it's interesting now because a lot of people, I already hear people saying, "Okay, I'm gonna trade Magnate out this week," and I'm like, like if I if I had pulled the trigger on that trade, there's zero chance I'd be trading him out. You just you've got to hold him now for because they're one of only two teams on the double next week. Um, he, mm -hmm. he disappointed. There was no doubt he's disappointed. It's actually come out today. I I didn't know this, but it actually came out. There was no info about this at all. It actually came out. He was a game time decision. Yeah, so he had the flu. Uh, yeah, and he, like he I didn't see that flu. anywhere. Yeah, so you know that obviously. Um, you know that obviously contributed to to what we saw happen, particularly in that Perth game. So fairly uh, a little, well, a little bit polarizing. I would even say Magna. It's a fairly enigmatic character, and it just it's hard to tell with him. And that's why, like, I ended up not getting him in, um, and I went Harold instead. 
And I was happy with the decision because I didn't want to have to make that decision this week. And I was always going to be like you said, if I get magna, it's for it's for a few weeks. So, you know, am I going to be able to stomach that next week? And I'm, I couldn't. So Harrell was an easy one because I had him both weeks. Um, but going back to Magna, like if you look at that first game that he played in, he wasn't hampered and he got two rebounds in 28 minutes, I think, or whatever his minutes were, which were normal. Um, he got two rebounds. And he just wasn't you – know, people made the, the right comment that Cairns did a good job of keeping him away from the basket and how they defended and their schemes worked. But at the same time, someone of Magnet's calibre, you kind of expect him to do a bit more. But, again, you talk about him being a bit of an enigmatic character. He goes out and bombs two threes, which you don't expect, but then he can't rebound or block shots. Yeah, and he just, he just seems to do this in round – one, I think it was, or maybe it was round two, but I'm pretty sure it was round one. He was falling all over the place, and I thought he was going to hurt himself because yeah. he was just on the ground 18 times in the last quarter. And it was just like, mate, you are such a worry to me in yeah. so many different ways. So I just sort of reminded myself of all that last week, and that's why I kind of stayed away. Yeah, and and look, I it was actually a, a bit of a discussion I had online with uh, one of the godfathers of Supercoach, uh, Tim Michelle, um, leading him to the round uh, about Magne. Uh, like, he was massive on him. He brought him in and captained him Then spent a lot of Sunday afternoons swearing at me uh, via via Twitter. Uh, sorry, X. Uh, but he actually said to me prior to the round, he said, look, one thing about Magne is he's not going to get... Now, I, I don't know if it was steals or blocks, but he's, he got five steals or blocks in, in that game, which is obviously... Every one of those is three, so it's 15 points. That helped really mm-hmm. bump up his score to that 50-plus or whatever it was. And that made me really, really think about it, going, okay, well, if I'm not going to have him for a double of round four and he's not going to get five blocks, then I'm going to try and risk it. And that was part of the reason that, um, you know, I didn't bring him in myself. So, Yeah, no, look, I didn't – I don't want any listeners to think that it's – you know, I don't think it's a bad trade. I just think that you just you weighed up and it was never a slam dunk. You know, he is a great super coach player. And when he's on, yeah. he's going to be the best center you could have. It's just all the other stuff around that you've got to kind of weigh up. And um, it's one of those guys that you can risk not getting because he does have these weeks. The thing that we didn't see on the weekend too, DVG, is that he, he has foul trouble too. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he has these games where he gets done for fouls really early and he ends up in big trouble and it really limits him. So. Yeah, look, yeah. we should get into trading because we start to talk about players anyway. Uh, before we yeah. do, we'll just quickly mention the the draw because it's ever important in NBL. Uh, we've got three doubles this week. We've got the Sydney Kings, we've got the Cairns Taipans, and we've got the Adelaide 36ers. Really important to note, I think, and this is where I think may people need to look ahead. You know, it's, you can't just look at one week and say these are the three teams with a double. You need to see what's happening the following. For me, it's the next week definitely, but probably it's even two weeks ahead what's happening. And mm-hmm. when I look at it, actually, I look, if you didn't get on Adelaide last week, then you might want to hold off now. Uh, and we'll talk about specific players, but I actually think Kansas has got the better schedule uh, because Kansas has got a double and they've got a single next week and then they're back to a double, whereas Adelaide has several weeks after this one where they're on singles and you're just going to be selling off any Adelaide players. So clearly the Kings are going to be right at the top. Um, but I would, funnily enough, put the Cairns guys... Uh, it's probably a better scheduled double game week this week than uh, than the Adelaide guys. Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, the fact that um, you know the Cairns have that one on on the round six, like you basically will be holding anyone for the round five, um, and then yeah. So look, if, if you if you didn't have those Adelaide pieces, I wouldn't advise bringing them in now, like unless you you are very very consciously going. I'm doing this for one week. So, Matt, look, maybe maybe Kendrick Davis is a one-week play because his BE is going to be yeah. pretty low after that performance. The, the buyer beware thing on Kendrick Davis, he looked awesome as an owner. That was – I really enjoyed, you know, watching what he did. He obviously uh, reacted very well to Olgan's tweet. Uh, uh, you know, it really proved a lot of people wrong. The thing that people have to be mindful of is that this week he's got two really tough matchups, right? Arguably, probably two of the toughest matchups, um, you know, in the league in Melbourne United and the Sydney Kings. So it would be great to see him put up those sort of numbers again. He obviously played Illawarra, who would arguably be one of the top three, um, I think. Um, you know, so he's capable. I'm just saying, like, some of these Melbourne United and, and Sydney Kings players, they, they, 
you know, they do know how to put screws on people. So we probably just have to be a little bit mindful. Um, you know, if we're doing Kendrick, um, we're doing it for maybe a bit of money, but we're maybe not expecting, you know, the type of scoring that he scored um, in last week's round. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. And when you're looking at the schedule, you know, the Kings, the Kings have Adelaide and Cairns. Now, I, I certainly have more respect for Adelaide and Cairns this week than what I did two weeks ago. Uh, I think, you know, Adelaide getting a win at the Snake Pit away at Illawarra was big for them. Um, and also Cairns too haven't had their full complement of players and then all of a sudden they half got there and they looked really good and they were scoring. I think they scored 100 points or pretty close to it. <laughs> like they were just on fire. So they, they might feel better, but at the same time, they're still going to be, I think at the moment, good super coach matchups. So the Kings... Kings have got the two good games, so you have to ramp up on trying to get those guys in as a priority. Interesting what you say about Adelaide, because I agree with you. Adelaide playing the Kings, even though it is at home for them, uh, it's still going to be a Kings game that can put a lot of points on in a hurry. And then they're going to be away in Melbourne, and away in Melbourne for Adelaide is going to be tough against a full-strength United. By that point, you'd expect Delhi to be back and not worrying about the baby anymore and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And then you look at Cairns. Like Cairns is similar to Adelaide in that I'm not sure what to make of them. Like, what do you make of them? Because they've got to go – they've got to go a home game first up. And it is against Perth. So, you'd think, oh, look, Perth is hard. I haven't actually liked what I've seen from Perth very much. And the travel from Perth to Cairns is massive. That's a big trip for Perth. So, I actually like Cairns to even upset in this one. But, you know, traditional thinking says, oh, that's hard having to play Perth. And then they have to go away and play Sydney. Uh, which is definitely going to be tough for them. So oh, I couldn't I couldn't tell what I thought about the Cairns one myself with their matchups. It's it's so tough, isn't it? Because Cairns started the season just so putrid in that first match. It was just so they were so bad. Like it was just so beyond bad. I was in there going, God, I I really like some of their pieces. What I saw of the Blitz, I was like, you know, these guys, you might be something. And then it was so bad. And then all of a sudden, bam, they they look good again. And how how amazing is it? Uh, not just for the Cairns Taipans, for the NBL, seeing Taron Armstrong come back the way he did. Um, you know, he just looked so good. He, like, I just was totally blown away uh, by some of the things he did in that game. Obviously, he's been coming off a bit of an interrupted preseason off that injury. And, and look, he did show, show some issues in the second game uh, with some sort of foot issue. But outside of that, he just looked so great and... At that price point of one hundred ninety three thousand, I don't I don't actually know if I care of who they're playing against. He's um, to me he looked great. Like as long as we get the all clear about that foot injury, um, and obviously he also got smacked in the head uh, later in the game as well. Uh, but if everything's all good on those fronts, I think he almost has to be, has to come into everyone's teams. Are you sound, Barzi? Uh Looking at what everyone's doing on the trade market at the moment. Um, I think the trade-outs all make sense, so we'll probably skip over them just about, but everyone's getting rid of United, guys. Um, everyone's getting rid of uh, Will Wagner as well, though, and Bryce Cotton. Look, these single-game week stars, you know, Bryce Cotton, you got to get rid of again. He was always going to be a rental, but you you spoke about Will Wagner before. Let's talk about him. Um, so I am of your opinion that if you got him in last week, you kind of decided you were going to hold him. But I would say that probably there's a lot of teams that are having a bit of buyer's remorse and are also looking at ways to get cooks. So even though I agree with you, um, I will say that there's certainly some team makeups where if the team looks pretty good on their double game week players and they're set up well, you could maybe just sacrifice that and say, you know what, if I need to get him back in a week, I can because that's my avenue to cooks. And if it is your only avenue to a double game week guy that could explode this week, then some of those teams are going to have to make that type of trade. But I think obviously we're probably in agreement that you need to see whether you have to do that. Because if you don't, Magna is a fine hold. I don't think people should feel like they need to be getting him out. Yeah, look, it's it's a really tough balance, right? And I, it's one of these things you... The reason that I think we're both saying you'd hold is because there's only two teams on a double next week, and one of those mm -hmm. teams is Tasmania. Now, I think if you look at all of the really high-ranked teams in Supercoach now, if you look down, none of those teams have any New Zealand and Tasmanian players, right? So they don't. So everyone's going to have to make some moves 
to do something about that next week in some way, way of shape and form. For those people who have got Magne, if you made the decision to get Magne, that may be your way of stemming some of the tide or, or chasing some rankings next week because a lot of the people that didn't bring him in we're going to struggle to bring him in next week, right? Because there's other things. There's, I mean, I'll probably have to ignore him personally because I'll be looking at New Zealand pieces because they have three consecutive double game weeks. So that's where I guess we're coming from, you know, from that Will Magne thing. On top of the fact that they've got that double, Tasmania also have doubles in round seven and eight. So it's one of these things you... You've obviously brought him in. There's a little bit of short-term pain because he hasn't uh, scored as well. We know he was crook. If he if he's not crook, right? Does does that scoring would that scoring be a bit be a little bit better? We look at a half glass full, right? He didn't play well in either game, but he still had a pretty good floor score in both games, right? So imagine what he can do if you know he has a better game, or if he's not, or if he's not feeling crook. So I think you, sometimes you just got to look at those things. I do understand what people are saying with cooks. I I was at the Boodle Entertainment Centre uh, the other night. I, I saw Cooks in the flesh, and he just ripped the bullets a new one. Like he just looks so good. Uh, he's one of the, one of the few Sydney people that actually players that actually look interested in wanting to beat them. A lot of them, I think, went up there knowing that they could win, and they really didn't seem to try. But Cooks was like a man on a mission. So you know, I understand why you do it. I think that people just have to be wary of of this schedule that you and I keep going back to. And and the opportunities that might be there for them if they were to hold Magna. Mm, well, look, I, I'm at the point end on the rankings at the moment, uh, probably through a lot of luck, but I'm there. And I don't have one Tasmanian player, and I don't have uh, one New Zealand player, obviously, because no one can own them at the moment. So I'm going to go into next week struggling, uh, and that's what teams that are chasing should be thinking about. Like you said, we can only make two trades in a week. And it's even with two trades, to even get two superstars is quite difficult for some team makeups. So right. you might say, oh, I'm going to get PJC and, and Magna in next week. But then when it comes to actually looking at your bank account, you might say, oh, I can only afford PJC and a 200K guy. And that's going to be a lot of teams. So yep. if you've got Magna, you're on the front foot already. And that's why the forward planning is really important. Uh, Jack White's another one that's really interesting discussion. I was really big on holding Jack White because Melbourne United have two singles now. And then they hit doubles again for a few weeks in a row. So I feel like people are going to want him back. But more importantly, he is one of those guys who can carry a decent score in a single. And this is what people need to remember. An NBL super coach, it is all about the double game weeks, but you're never going to have a full team of double game weeks. Certainly next week, you're not going to have a full starting five of double game weeks. Not even close probably for most teams. So Jack White then becomes really important because who are the guys that can score really well in a single? And Jack White is one of them. The other thing about him is over the next two weeks, he's got a current break even of nine at a value of 315000 He's going to make money this week and he probably will make money next week as well. If anything, he's not going to be any less money uh, for people to buy him back for when his doubles come and everyone's going to want him. So to me, he's a prime candidate to be holding. Uh, but I will admit even I, DVG, have looked at selling him because if I want cooks, what, what can I do? And there's these type of decisions that you're going to make in NBL Supercoach. So, so me, I'd rather hold him. Everything I could do, I'll try and hold him. But there's obviously cases where you need to sell. Yep. Great. So other guys, I think, are all not really too arguable, um, I'll, except there's this really weird one that I'm just going to throw out at you. Cam Oliver's on there, top 10 most traded out players. Uh, I assume that people are going Cam Oliver to Cooks, but... Man, it just seems like a bit of a waste if you already own Space Cam. Like, he's only got a 61 break even. He's probably going to hit about that many points, I would imagine, this week with the matchups. Yeah, look, I think th th this came down to the thing about getting Mag. So, if I, ha if I was to get Magna last week, I was going to trade Oliver. And if I traded Oliver, it means I wasn't going to have the double game week piece this week. And there was no way for me to get max double game week pieces on court this week. So that's the reason I sort of made that decision uh, myself. I understand why people are doing it though. Like Oliver obviously didn't score very well um, in that game against the Bullets. And to be frank, like people that were there could see it. He he just he just was not interested in that game at all. Like he, he just, it, the, like, I could actually see it in the warm-up and I actually texted a mate of mine saying, 
Cam Oliver just does not look amped for this game at all. Like it just, he just, you know, when you can just see something in players, it was just like, you just don't look like you want to be there. Um, for those of us who have held him, you know, for this purpose, there's just no, I, I had a big discussion. It was probably 15 or 20 tweets long um, on X last night with people about it, you know, asking, should we play him? Should we trade him? All that sort of stuff. If you've held him, you absolutely play him, right? We, we've seen that in the blitz, what he did, we saw in a couple of games this year, he scored a couple of 31s. You know, if you've got someone that you've held who's dual position and they've got doubles in rounds four, six and seven, I think you just got to, you just, you just, you just hold him, right? It's there. Like there's, there's no real point in trading him to another double game week player. That doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I think you, you would just hold him and, and you just hopefully, um, you know, wake up and he wakes up and, and, you know, scores a bit better. We, we don't need him scoring these ridiculously high scores. If he could just knock out those thirties and stuff, that's, that's more than that. It was just that, that game, obviously, that game was a bit of an interesting game against the Bullets. The Bullets were just, you know, terrible. And, um, you know, as a result, there, there was a, a few, pe- pe- you know, players in the Kings that, you know, didn't didn't really, you know, feature as much as they normally would be. Yeah, I think that the, the Bullets and also the Phoenix have probably established themselves as they're on the bottom of the ladder, but they are legitimately on the bottom of the ladder. I don't see a lot of upside for them at the moment. And I think that they're your target matchups if you're... If you're playing either of them, interestingly, they're both playing each other this week. But if you're playing either of them, it's a good matchup, I think. Um, so I definitely think that context is important and it's lost sometimes with NBL Supercoach, especially because there's a lot of uh, – one of the great things about Supercoach doing NBL now is that a lot of casual fans have come in and started to watch game basketball in Australia and it's great. But what then happens is that you do – some of those people do tend to just look at scores or look at highlights and stuff and you don't really get a good context for the game. The context for that game was Brisbane getting pounded right at the start. Like they had a – I think it was a 12-point first quarter or something, 13-point first quarter. They were awful. And Kings had it in the bag. You know, I, I do not understand why Cooks got to play so much, but he did. But he was the only one. Um, everybody else, like Jalen Adams came in in the second half again. And threw like an alley to Bull Quoll that was never going to happen. And it was his fifth turnover, and he was laughing about it. And they were high fiving, like, because yeah. they didn't care. <laughs> like, the no. game was so far over, and the rotations were all so ridiculous. Like, you're yeah. not going to see that again. No. So, no. you can just throw out last week to me. Like, I don't even think that you even worry about that. What was Cam Oliver doing before? Well, he's a really consistent 30 points a game, and I don't think he's ever yeah. going to be strapped yet coming off the bench. So, uh, look. Let's talk about guys coming in. Taran Armstrong is the number one guy, uh, 199,000. I was talking before we started recording to a couple of people, and I said, I think that Taran Armstrong is the must-have player of the round, possibly the must-have player of the year so far. He is really cheap for what he's producing. Uh, a guy that can go a, a 25-5 and five type of average, which is what he showed on the weekend, uh, is great. But one of the things that I said, DVG, when I was watching that first game is, he both looked awesome, but also still rusty at the same time. Yeah. It's like, wow, what if in a week's time he's not rusty anymore? What's this going to look like? You know, you, at his break even, at his price, to me, 13 break even with the double and also single double the next two weeks, you almost have to sacrifice even one, some of the other guys that people might think are must haves, like a Cooks and stuff, to be able to get an Armstrong in because he could legitimately be the best money maker, maybe even this year. Yeah, uh, look, I, I don't think there's any doubt with that. Um, you know, he was one of the best money makers last year uh, in the game, and obviously missed uh, the six games at the start of the year or something. Um, and he, all the talk in the off season was that you know he had the keys to the team and all this sort of stuff. A lot of us content people put him in, you know, in in all of our things as his team, and then injury struck, right? And so and then things all blew up. And for a guy who missed such a, a massive portion of, um, you know, the preseason with that injury, he just came in and he just was fantastic. And he made the rest of the Cairns team look fantastic. The space he created for them, you know, and the 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 opponents really didn't have an answer for anything that he was throwing at them. Um, I He just has to come in. The only thing is, is he did come off um, with a foot complaint. He did get it strapped. Those of you who are watching the game closely, when he came down uh, off a couple of plays, you'll see that he landed and he propped awkwardly two or three times. So 
he looked like he was still looking fantastic, but there was something still go- definitely going on uh, with his foot. We are blessed in the sense that Cairns is first up. So we're going to know on Thursday no travel whether either. or not he's playing. No travel. We're going to know you know, whether or not he's actually playing. So if he plays the first one, if we know that he's in the team in the first one, I think you just got to get him in. Um, if they start saying things like game time decision and stuff like that, I would be, I would start to maybe question whether or not I was going to make the move because if you're a game time decision and you're also at a double game week, you know, all of a sudden you you trade in one thinking like Dylan Windler, Dylan Windler is a, a perfect example. Like they were saying, oh, you know, he'll be a game time decision, game decision. We actually hope he's going to play. And he ended up getting scratched from both games, um, and that would mm-hmm. be a disaster. You trade in someone that ends up scoring zero both times. So. We've got that benefit with the first game. If he's playing, I think you pull the trigger at that price point because he looks fantastic. Um, you know, if not, then we've just got to pivot and work out some other things. Yeah, even even if he plays the first game and ends up irritating it and um, misses a second, it's, it's fine because you're going to get yeah. him in anyway and he's still yeah. going to make money and you're still going to want him. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm all aboard the Armstrong train. And I'll say, like, I was like you and like you said, the other content creators, I had him in my side right from the start of NBL opening, but... I still did not expect him to look as good as what he did. And okay. people can always make the calls of, oh, he's going to have the keys to the team. And blah. And you've got all these new American imports that come in and they don't know Armstrong. They're not just going to... A lot of those guys don't normally just go, oh, here's the keys, young point guard yep. that's played one year before. Like, no. But they all did. Like, it looked to me like the team worked well with him. He legitimately did have the keys. And the other guys were happy to play off him and let him have the ball. He had a couple of clutch shots down the track uh, in that fourth quarter that basically closed the game out, and that was him. It wasn't any of their imports doing it or any other big-name guys. Um, so I also was quite surprised at how confident he was because he seemed completely happy and confident to do it. Um, quite yeah. amazed, actually, at the performance. So I love him. I, I think that you've got to get him in as long as he's obviously not ruled out. But uh, Xavier Cooks is a little bit harder for a few reasons. So he's going to be the premium points guy. He's obviously going to have that, those Kings matchups that we said are fantastic. He is $406,000. So that is extremely expensive to try and get into your side. Um, but everyone's clamoring to do it, obviously, because he's coming off a 48-point game against Brisbane where he absolutely killed it. Um, I'm going to go glass half empty, and I reckon you're probably glass half full, so this should work out pretty well. I am considering not getting him, even though I think it's a great trade. Um, and my glass half empty points on him are going to be, yeah, he scored 40 against Brisbane, but Brisbane are terrible. Um, and secondly, watching the game, when I was talking about context before, he stayed on. He kept staying on to the point that he was actually playing point when Adams was off and bringing the ball up the court and running plays. He was playing with a lot of bench guys that probably won't even get minutes or will get limited minutes this week. You know, the rotations were crazy where he was clearly the best player on the team by a long way for half of his playing time on the weekend. Uh, and he was just doing whatever he wanted. He hit two of two threes. He's not a three-point shooter. He was hitting all of his free throws. Uh, it was just the perfect storm DVG for me. And I don't think that that will happen again. Now, does that mean it's a bad... It's not a bad play because he's still going to score 60-plus at a minimum floor. Um, but is that something that an Oliver could give you for 140K less and you don't have to trade someone like a Jack White you don't want to? You know, Those are the things that I'm tossing up. Yeah, no, no, I understand. Uh, look, he, he really wasn't on my radar at all, I guess, until seeing that because I knew what the price point was. Uh, I, I think the hard thing is is that so far his worst score of the year is 34. So he scored he scores so far at 38, 34, 43, and 48. That's pretty good, you know, to, to have yeah. not fallen under, under 30 um, so far. Um, you know, and he, that 48 he scored against the Bullets, yeah, he stayed out longer than everyone else, but but he he he, he did that in 25 minutes as well. So um, clearly, you know, he's um, you know he's someone that you know the outfit trust and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, look, it, it's it's just so tough. The price point is is really really tough. It's just hard. Uh, it's going to be hard for a lot of us to to get him in. I purposely opened up a lot of funds in my team instead of tra- doing the Magno trade, I traded all the way down to Elijah Pepper. 
um, to open up funds uh, in my team. And I, I remember when I posted I was doing that, oh, God, some people looked at me interestingly. Um, <laughs> but it opened up $177,000 in my salary cap. And, you know, he 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 generated something like 36000 or something. So I've got some flexibility. My original plans were, you know, I was going to look at getting Adams in for Illy and all that sort of stuff. But with the Taron Armstrong thing, uh, now there and looking so impressive, I might even have the flexibility of being able to go Illy to Armstrong and being upgrade to being able to upgrade someone in my forward line to Cooks. Um, I don't think everyone is going to have that luxury. You know, I think that people who are like, you know, going to be holding on to a Magna are probably going to really, really struggle. Uh, people who want to hold on to a Jack White are probably going to really, really struggle. So um, it is. It's one of those things. I guess... The schedule is the important thing. We look at the double four, double game weeks on the four, six, and seven. We know that he can score pretty well on a single. So if you go double game week four, going to be one of the better scorers on a single in round five, and then doubles in six and six and seven, maybe it is worth doing. Um, I guess you've just got to work out what the impact for the rest of your team is going to be. Oh, I 100% agree with you. And, you know, you mentioned that... There's Adams there as well, and he's in the top 10 too, so we may as well talk about them together. He's almost the same sort of price. He's 408000 There's $2,000 difference between them. People aren't going to be able to get both. I already have Adams, but I tell you what, I would almost be leaning towards prioritising Adams over Cooks, which is something the market's not doing. Uh, and the reason for it is because Cooks is already 27% owned. He's much higher owned than what I anticipated he was. He's owned by a lot of teams. And after this round, it's probably going to be 35 plus percent. Uh, Adams is only in 17% of teams currently. And even on the trade-ins at the moment, he's the ninth most popular trade target. He might only be around the 20% mark. So almost halving the ownership of Cooks. And when you look at the matchups, if you want to look you know, down to the nitty-gritty, uh, we spoke about Magne earlier. You know What did Cairns do with Magne? He only had a couple of boards in the first game because they just kept him away from the rim. And it, the paint was really hard for him. Uh, you look at the Adelaide matchup, what happens with them? Well, at the moment, they're playing the Twin Towers. They've started Harrell now, and he's going to continue to start alongside Humphreys, who had his coming out party in the weekend because they were really hard to handle with both big guys down low. So all of a sudden, you look at those matchups and you go, they're good matchups for Supercoach scoring, um, but where are the Supercoach points going to come from? Well, I don't think it's going to be as easy in the paint, and that's Cook's bread and butter. Um, where it is going to be easier is in the guard spots and on the perimeter. And that's Jalen Adams' bread and butter. So I actually think that this could be a flip week where Adams goes back to two weeks ago and so does Cooks. And you might get 65 to 70 from Cook, Cooks, but um, I think that Adams is primed for sort of an 80-pluser. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. Like, we know what Adams is capable of, right? We have, we absolutely know what Adams is, is capable of doing. And we also know that what we saw, you know, some of those things where some of those turnovers, which sort of, I guess, contributed to his low score against the Bullets, where, you know, he did just do some silly things, which every time he did one of those silly things, it was minus two. And there was at least two of them that were like... He's not going to do that another he's, games, sort of, yeah. he's not going to do another game. And he shrugged his shoulders after doing it. So, you know, if you take those out, he breaks 30 in that game. Um, so, yeah, like it's um, – I mean, my full intention before these games started last week, my full intention was opening up money for Adams. That was, that was what I was doing, opening up money for Adams. So, you know, I think um, I think people just need to – obviously – you can't escape for the fact of what Cooks has done and his his worst scores being 34, but you just got to also be aware that it might, he might not get it all his own way like he did. Uh, two Adelaide boys, uh, really popular, both Kendrick Davis and also Montrezl Harrell. Uh, Davis has a 29 break even on double game week, 322,000. It's a, it seems like a no-brainer. To me, it was a no-brainer last week, though. He was a 277,000. He was my must-have of last week. I ended up captaining him right from the start. I was really happy to do so. Um, he scored 41 and 45 points last week. Now, the first couple of weeks, we kind of all said, he's scoring well at 29 and 33 points, but none of his shots are dropping and he's shooting bad. That's going to stop. That did stop, and he scored what we thought he would in the 40s. So you couldn't ever talk anyone out of it on a double game week. He would be the number one Adelaide target for me. Um, it's probably just one of those things where 
you got to recognise after this week you traded him because you can't keep any Adelaide guys. You certainly can't get two of them, uh, which is why I, I got Harold last week for the back-to-back weeks. 46 break even. Look, he'll probably get 15-odd points above it. He seems pretty steady on the 30s, um, but he doesn't seem to have much of a ceiling either. So I loved the Harold trade last week. This week, DVG, I'd actually look for other avenues that uh, you can hold a bit longer, knowing that if you don't have Martin, um, sorry, if you don't have Davis, you have to get Davis in and you can't have both because you're going to be trading them out straight away. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Look, it's um, it's one of those things. Um, I tell you, how much how much fun is it being a super coach owner and uh, and watching Harold? Um, oh yeah, not just Harold. It, honestly, I just not the turnover. So that six game turnover, turnover, five turnover. games turnover. Oh, yeah. I get it, but I just <laughs> I loved it. I, I just loved it. I love what he what he's brought to the NBL. I hope and pray they find a way uh, to keep him in the league. It's been uh, it's been a great show. I've, I've literally never tuned into Adelaide games the way that I've tuned into these ones. It's been such a, a pleasure to watch, and being a super coach owner of him has helped. Uh, but, yeah, look, go, going back to the nitty-gritty, look, Adelaide don't have another double now. Uh, so after their round four double, they don't have another double to round 11. So... You're not going to be keeping him. You're going to be moving him on. He's done. His, he's done his job. If you're only going to, if you literally want to pick one of them on a double, you would definitely pick Davis because of the BE, and we know mm. these ceilings better than so. Yep. I don't know why. Okay. My my phone auto corrects Davis to Martin occasionally when I type really badly and I'm not looking. And now I've started calling him Martin every now and then. So <laughs> I obviously meant Davis. Corrected myself. Uh, Rob Edwards is another popular superstar. Two hundred ninety-five thousand. He's been scoring really well. Uh, he fit pretty well with uh, Armstrong. He's only 9% of the team, so he's currently a pod. Um, almost 300K, though. I am going to talk people out of this one a little bit. He's got 25 and 31 points on the weekend. Um, okay. Not great for the money. Uh, so, you know, if he does the same thing again, are you really going to be happy with 56 points? And I would say, no, you're not going to be. Um, for that money. So I think there's other options. I wouldn't be looking towards him. I think that Armstrong coming in is only going to take away from him now a little bit. And I'd also say, DVG, that we've got uh, Edwards' game that looks eerily similar to someone like a Jordan Crawford last year, where at times Jordan Crawford was good. But these guys who are shooters and scorers and not much else, uh, it isn't great for their super coach because they need to have, you know, you see them blast out four threes and score 32 points and you're like, oh, wow, this is going to be amazing. And you look at the super coach score, it's like 29. You know, oh, they didn't do anything else. Uh, and that's the problem with guys like Rob Edwards. I just don't think that they translate well enough. And then you've got all those moving parts as well. I just think there's other options other than him. Yeah, I think so. Look, again, uh, Rob Edwards, a player that I've loved watching play so far. Really love his energy, uh, passion, all that sort of stuff. He's got a bit of stick in him too. Like, I really love how he's you know does stuff and then turns around to the opposing benches. It's great. Uh, look, he's very one-dimensional from a super coach accumulation uh, point of view. Really does rely, you know, on, on getting those buckets. He, he can absolutely do it. We've seen that. But, you know, if, if he has an off night and if he has an off night against some harder competition uh, that's coming up, you know, it's um, there's probably other other ways to, to spend almost 300000 Yeah, I agree. Um, so we'll talk about the cheapies that everyone's getting in. Cheapies to mid-rangers, there's quite a few. Uh, Le Pepe, he's still got only an eight break even. He's continued to start, but also... Um, Seems to be getting better and better. So he had a 23-point game against Brisbane. And it wasn't because of the minutes either. He actually played lower minutes than what he has. So he's been playing exactly 18 minutes a game, every game for the first three. And then against Brisbane, he plays 16 minutes. Yet he scores 23 points. You know, So he's gone 10, 17, 12, and 23. Um, he seems to be getting more confident. So to me, I think you still can go there at 117,000. I still think there's money to be produced. What I would say to people is, to me, he's a longer burn one, though, if you're going to invest in him um, because they've obviously what, got the single again next week, Sydney. Am I right? So they go they go round four double, round six double, round seven double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they've got that single. So that's going to stunt him, right? So you're then going to have really wanting to hold him until the end of round seven and then be selling him off. So can you afford to have him, I guess, for four weeks is what you're going to have to ask yourself because obviously limited roster space in NBL, um, some teams might be a bit hamstrung to to wait that long. So I think if you get him in, you've got to, you've got to be able to wait that long with him on your roster. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
one that he's just the one that got away for me. I'm I'm very frustrated in the start of the year with him. Again, seeing him in the flesh, he looked great. He looked really, really good. Uh, geez, he's a he's a physical specimen. I tell you, he looks like he's a rugby league player uh, more than a. More oh, than I've a said on the week. Like, I I've played basketball for years up the road, and you always get. And when I started, I was a rugby league player playing basketball when I was a teenager, and um, you, you get it all the time. Andrew Fafita from the Sharks, you know, was played a season there and stuff. He gets me when. You see these guys, and they are rugby league players that are filling in for mates teams that are basketball players. And it's yeah. exactly what he looks like. Like they got one of their mates to come and leave rugby league training early just to come and fill in some spots. Yeah, no, he's, he's he looks incredible. But look, he's he's talented and and he's cheap. And look, yeah, he's already made fifty thousand. But a lot of people on their benches, right, are going to have like a, a Will Hickey. At the moment, right? So they'll have a, a Will Hickey somewhere on their bench, or they'll have, you know, some people might even have an Allbridge uh, still, you know. So if you look at his price point, and then you look at the fact that he's got a B of nine, and then you go, Sydney's got doubles in four, six, and seven. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a world that it's not too late for him, and maybe there is a world like if he's going to be a bench player that is averaging fifteen to sixteen, so half of that is eight for this period and he's got all those doubles, maybe maybe that's better than holding off and waiting for, you know, your Hickey or your Aubridge's, you know, to hit their doubles in round six. Um, you know, I get it. Like it's a it's a it's a tr- you know, you're spending a trade, but we've all we've got to make certain moves to make things work. Like if you stay too stagnant on one player and just forget about it and leave them there on 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 your super coach bench, all of a sudden they can actually become a problem. Like if you mm-hmm. if you sit there and say, look, you know, I'll just leave him there. All of a sudden, all that money that you might have generated from them and all that sort of stuff, it just peters out. So you do have to start strategically looking. It's not just about those on-field pieces because every single point counts, okay? And all of your money generation counts. So if you've got some of those people on your bench that are just petering out or haven't really performed as well, maybe someone like Le Pepe, he's – it's not going to be an instant thing, but with a BE of nine, and that's a BE of nine over two games, remember, like if, if he was to knock out a 25, like he'll make some more coin again. His BE will be pretty low again for round five, and then you've got the double game weeks in round six and seven. So um, it does take some creative thinking, but you know, he's de- I don't think it'll be the worst move. No, I, I think he's definitely going to keep making money. You just got, you just going to have to hold on to him and keep making it. That's all. Yeah. Um, his teammate, though, I don't like coming in. Um, so Tyler Robertson's been coming to teams, and I he had a bit of hype before the season, um, but that's his first game time that he got on the weekend, and people are jumping on. Firstly, he has to play these next two games this weekend to make money. That's what people need to remember as well for his price to change. And secondly, that we keep going back to the context of the Bullets game, mate. He wouldn't have played if it was a competitive game. You know, they're up by 33 points at one point. Um, Robinson got good burn. Uh, yeah, he looked he looked okay, but I just don't think in normal rotations he's going to get the minutes. So he's he's a quintessential wait and see for me. And you know, if you see it this weekend and he does happen to go up an extra 7k or something because he plays two games, then jump on next week. But you, you got to wait for more information on him, in my opinion. No, I think you definitely do. Um... You know, I think Jalen Adams only played nine minutes in that first half and he came on, Robinson came on um, for that. And yeah, like I just don't think he's going to do that in the rotation. He did have hype uh, in in the preseason. And if you have a look at some of his videos from overseas, he actually goes real good. Like I, mm. I was really, really impressed with some of his videos, but we are dealing with a fairly stacked Sydney uh, roster and... I think that context of the fact that that game was just a total blowout, that was the only reason he played. I think if you look at those first few games, that's a pointer of, um, you know, of, of where Robertson's going to be. So a guy that's a bit more expensive, but still in that mid-cheap area, is Kyron Galloway for the Kent's Tie Pens. He's 186,000. He's actually gone up 38.5,000. So we kind of missed out on him a little bit. He had 36 points against United. In 28 minutes, uh, 17 in 28 minutes of the game before, which is still pretty solid as 17 at that price point. 25 in round two versus Adelaide in 21 minutes. Um, he's got three weeks in a row now where he's played 21 plus minutes, and it just seems like he's now going to be part of Adam Ford's very feared rotation because you never know what it's going to stick to. But 
three games now we've got. I initially looked at this DVG and went, I don't really have any interest in going near Galloway. Um, I'm a bit worried about all the moving parts in Cairns and the guys to come back. But the more I looked at the scores and did the math, math on it and the numbers, it, you can't really say it's a bad move. Um, I, I think that he could make legitimately quite a bit of money this round um, and keep doing it for you to even hold him. So I don't, I'm not going to do it, but I, I think that it could work out. And I might even think that this is one of the ones that got past me where, you know, I wish I got him in a week ago because it would have been uh, so much better. This is a tough one because um, Tanner Groves obviously played plays a bit of a bit of an aspect in this. Like Tanner Groves obviously didn't play in that fourth mm. game, so he did. You know, obviously start in that game because Tanner didn't. And Cairns have had various missing pieces, right? So they didn't have Taron. Um, you know, for the for the start of the game, so he didn't play because of all those things. I guess. It's really hard to ignore how uh, ignore how well he actually played though in in that United game. Like he was a big reason why they actually beat United. Like he he was just throwing threes down like it was you know it was like Christmas. I couldn't believe it. I was just sitting there going, he's just landed another one. He just landed another one. He just looked great. Um, it's just it's just that really awkward price point. Like if he didn't go up as much and he was one thirty or one forty, I probably would. I'd actually be really, really interested in it because I think that with their doubles in round four and six, you know, he just he just was someone that would make sense. He's going to make money and, you know, he looks like that he's going to have some sort of minutes in the rotation. Um, it's just one of those, I don't know if you want to refer to it as fool's gold. I just worry that with the Tanner Groves minutes, you got to remember Tanner Groves only played eight minutes in round two, in the round two game and then he obviously didn't play in this one. Taron didn't play in rounds one and two. So, I think you've always just got to take into into account that there was stuff going on with the rotations both times, which may have contributed to the minutes that he played. Yeah, it, it's an awkward price point now, um, for sure. Because, like you said, if, if you're going to get sort of thirty to forty points off a guy because it's a double game week and he's cheap enough, then it's it's the ultimate bench option to have. Um, he's just a little bit outside that, and that creates a little bit more risk. And I. I always say with these things, it doesn't even have to be NBL super coach. It's also in NRL super coach, and I barely play AFL, but even that, like, if you've got, got someone starting, then you just do it. But when they're not starting, if they're coming off the bench, it's always such a massive risk because bench, you're obviously not a starter. Your role is very flexible in what way it can go, what minutes you can play, and what your role is going to be. Um, if you're starting, you know you're always kind of guaranteed a decent amount of minutes and roll. You're not when you're on the bench. And that's the thing that probably really gives me hesitation. Uh, Wardenberg, though, um, to finish up on these guys before we talk about some pods and then captains, he's he's popular again. Uh, I reversed him last week. I, um, I'll refer to what you said before, though, because my argument against getting Wardenberg in again, I, I feel that people, he was always a trade that was going to be good enough, which is what I said to the naysayers. Like, yeah, Wardenberg has let people down last year, but his floor is it's still going to be Decent points in a double game, and he's going to make money. You know, even if he only scores 20 points a game, it's fine. Um, the problem is that you, you kind of got lucky again because Tanner Groves didn't play that second game in the double game week. And that's now happened two weeks in a row where Tanner <laughs> Groves has played like five, six minutes and then like no minutes. So you keep getting these reprieves for Wardenberg. And when those reprieves stop, it's an issue. Uh, it'd still be okay to me if he was last week's price. Um, the fact that he's now gone up, you know, 30K and he's now 256,000, he's becoming expensive. He's almost at that starting import level of 277 in price point. So to me, he's close enough to be able to get some of these other guys that you know are going to give you really good points as opposed to the risky, you know, Wardenburg area when he's got a 50 break even now. Yeah. Um, look, I, I've been so taken back by how good, Berg's looked on court though, like he's looked great. He's he, he just really good too. Yeah, I just I just thought everything he's been doing is great. But again, we go back to some of the funny minutes that that have happened uh, because of absences. Um, yeah, like I just don't know with the the good imports that they've got with Taron and all that sort of stuff whether or not he's always going to get those minutes, especially if he doesn't shoot as well as he's been shooting. Uh, but he has been doing a bunch of everything. He's been blocking, you know, he's had, you know, some assists in there and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, uh, you lost your sound again, mate. Uh, the plug keeps coming out, sorry. Yeah, um, the uh, 
he had a really good um alley oop reverse layup that he did. Yeah. It was just like who did that? <laughs> I couldn't yeah, have been I'm... Waterberg. But I was just like, whoa, hello, where, where was this? Because we obviously, a lot of us paid a, a really good amount of attention to Cairns last year during their long stretch. And I remember sitting there, sitting there watching one of these games this year, Come oh, man, Berg wasn't doing this last year. Um, but <laughs> as as taken back as I was of his performances, I still felt he was going so good that his super coach scores should have been better. And I think that that's... A reflection I'm going, I don't know whether or not you could actually play that much better. Um, and if you can't play that much better, then I don't think you're going to score all that much better um, yeah. in the future. So that's sort of the reason why it sort of turned me off. Uh, I'm just going to mention a couple of little pods quickly before we move on to finish on the captaincies. Look, I, I'm i going to just say outright, I don't think that this is going to work, but one of the things that I always do when I'm looking at pods is I, I go and I search for filtering the guys that are on double game weeks and then I go down the list of the double game week teams for that round and say, who's a pod and who's really cheap? You know, that might actually be a, a good option that not many people are jumping on. I thought the Bull Quell was a really good signing by Sydney in the offseason um, and I've actually liked him in the team, but he hasn't hasn't translated. He's dropped almost 50K. He's now only 184,000. Now, like I said, I, I couldn't bring myself to do this but I'm going to say I think that there is some upside in him this round with the matchups um, because he's scoring. He's been really bad. Like he scored 14 on the weekend against Brisbane, but he only played 16 minutes. And then you look at oh, well, he played 27 and 28 minutes two weeks before he scored nine and eight. And then round yeah. one, I thought he looked fabulous, and he scored 21. Now, if he scores 21 on his price point now and keeps that up, it's actually really good. But the last three weeks, just the three games since, has just been throwaway games. They've just been awful. Now, I I can't do it, but I'm looking at it going, man, if you were like even just 30K less, I, I think I'd jump on and just hope at 150K. He's getting towards that level. Um, it might not be this round, but I might talk myself into it after next week when they got two doubles in a row again uh, on a bull call kind of, um, you know, free up 100k bank off somebody else downgrade because he's getting in that area so i do like to talk about some of the extreme pods no one's looking at he did catch my eye a little bit with the double game weeks coming up yeah uh i can't come into that at all <laughs> I can't, I can't, come on I, give like, me some call in a couple of weeks well, i get I, I i get he's got the minutes right he got the minutes but i just look i didn't see it there with him last year and you know he just hasn't shown it this year um I, i've got a pod for you though which is a bit interesting. And it's someone that I believe you may have actually talked about uh, at some point in the preseason. So it's a Tassie piece, um, which again is a little bit weird to be talking about now, but the, there's context to it. The reason why that I'm bringing this bloke up is because he's got a B of minus 12. So uh, Deng uh, yes. has got um, you know a break even of uh, minus 12. Excuse me while my computer just uh, whacks itself out here. Um, you know, And I mentioned I just... him because they obviously lost Lee there and it was always going to be a case of Magnus foul trouble that we mentioned and also he's, you know, he's been the only real big man that they got. You know, what are they going to do? Yeah, and, and look, I mean, it was concerning in rounds one and two when because I had looked at him after the discussion that we had in those early rounds and it was like, okay, he scored seven and 16 and 10 and 15. Okay. That's shit. Don't worry about it. And then all of a sudden he comes out in round, round three and he plays 21 minutes and he plays 30 minutes and he knocks out scores of 29 and 29. Uh, he looked great. Like he, he was actually a huge, like people point towards Milton Doyle being a huge factor in the, in the comeback win against Perth. I tell you, Magic Dang played a massive, massive role in that win. Like, he just was amazing in what he did. And I look at him and go, okay, you've got the round five double game week. You've got the round seven and eight double game weeks. You've got a B of minus, minus 12. He's just, again, we talk about the price point. He's 170. Had he been sub 150, I, I actually probably would have made the decision and pulled the trigger on him. I yep. brought him in because someone needs to support Magne. Um, and, you know, if Magne isn't going any good, like he wasn't in those things, um, they're clearly going to lean on him um, as a piece. So, yeah, look, I'm not going to be brave enough to do it. And, you know, 
I don't think at the price point, a lot of people are going to do it anyway. But I, I thought that he passed the eye in both games. Uh, minus 12 obviously means there's going to be cash on the table. People are going to be struggling for numbers next week in round five. If, if you were someone that maybe was a bit far back, wanted to look at it, things a, a different way and, and looking at a way to jump rankings next week, um, when a lot of people don't have double game week players, potentially mm-hmm. going early on someone with a break even of minus 12, um, who's clearly got some sort of role in the team, might be a go. Yeah, well, he's got a nice bit of length that they need. And they, they're not playing Gak, who's, who's another you know, forward centre option. So, yeah, I, I quite like it. Um, the only other one I was going to mention that I wish I could like, and it's wish because I can't like it or recommend it, I thought Pedro Bradshaw was going to be so much better than he is. He's got a double game week. He's only 238000 He's actually pretty cheap. And I was like trying desperately this week to talk myself into it, but he just cannot score well. And he looks like he should be a really good athlete, but it's just not translating. So, I mean, he was the other one that I was just like, look, he could buck the trend and have a really good round this round, but nobody should buy him. <laughs> but I could see it. I'm interested to watch it. It is because in the Blitz, he looked great. Again, I, mm. he was one of the Kansas, one of these teams I saw in the flesh in the Blitz, and I was like, who the hell is this? And then I figured out who it was, and I was like, wow, this, this guy's great. Um, it, it really hasn't translated. Um, you know, he's just, yeah, I don't know. Like, scores, if it just doesn't look. You, you look at scores of 17 and 31 minutes, 17 and 26 minutes, 12 and 23, and then 26 and 29, you go, that's that's gross, uh, you know, for this import. And, and he's lost money. And that's when I looked at him losing money, I was like, okay, that's pretty cheap. Um, yeah. You know, that's pretty cheap. His highest score is his most recent one. So that'll be the one that sort of holds true in his, um, you know, in his further cash gen. But it just, it's so hard. I, th- I think there's other people, uh, other people at sort of better price points um, to do it. But, um, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely better options. I just, I, if I was going to pick someone that no one should trade in, that I could see busting out a, you know, a sixty point um, round out of nowhere in a double game week, I'd, I'd probably throw it on Bradshaw. Uh, good money for the uh, <laughs> the betting partners that we don't have on the hub. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's look at captaincy options before we finish up, mate. Uh, who do you like, DBG? Top three captaincy options for the round. Go for it. Okay, uh, top three. Um, we will go. We've already highlighted uh, these, I think, throughout it, but um, they've got to be double game week pieces, so they have to be from Cairns, Adelaide, or Sydney. Uh, I think Jalen Adams, number one. Uh, Xavier Cook's number two. And number three, Adelaide do have the harder matchups, but we've seen his ceiling, so I have to say Kendrick Davis. How super vanilla of you. Uh, is my favourite milkshake flavour, though. So we will go with it. Uh, I have Jalen Adams, number one. Uh, by a um, short stretch over over Cooks, um, but I think those are the two options. Uh, I think you're going pretty downhill to get to that third one, but I agree with you. You're bank on Davis's form. Um, and generally, you know, when imports like him do take some time. Um, you mentioned Olgan's t- tweet at the start. I actually think everybody was right. I don't think anyone was wrong. Oh, I saw all of it from... From Davis as well that Olgan said, and and at the end of the day, Davis had to prove it to people, you know, that he could adjust and play better and stuff, and he did to his credit. But you know, whilst I agree with him, hey, you know, I'm I'm not in a big market team, so having a crack at me, maybe, but I can play well. Yep, yeah, and I was on all on board with him, mate. Well done, you showed what you can do, and you played well. But you know what, Olgan probably had a point, and you need to do that again. So yeah. I think that he's still going to have that little chip. Um, but one thing is that when you have scorers and shooters like him, uh, they can go hot for a couple of weeks and um, maybe he can bring that into this round. So I don't mind it. He's going to be a super pot option again because everybody's going to rightly jump on on the Kings guys. Uh, I'm going to, I put Adams as one though too because I mentioned the ownership earlier. He's only 17% owned at the moment. Uh, Cooks will be the most popular captain. I could almost guarantee that's going to happen. Yeah. So. Go against the crowd. Um, this could be Adams this week could be almost like last week's Davis, except not quite as low. Agree. Awesome. Well, that is the round for uh for round four. Uh thanks very much for jumping on, DBG, defending champ, uh constant hub source of info. Um, and yeah, I'll be jumping on in a couple of weeks again. Um, but um, you'll be on in the future too. Hopefully I'll get you on for a couple of weeks, but, uh, 
thanks very much and uh, enjoy the week. Hopefully you go up in the ranks and you're going to the top 1,000 this week. I reckon you will. Thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, to everyone in the hub, always enjoy uh, chatting with you guys on, on our Discord in there. It's uh, some good banter on there. See, a, few, a lot of you guys have uh, started uh, following us on Twitter. I don't know whether or not that's, uh, that's a good or a bad thing. Um, people... People need to follow people. People who want to know the real info and Supercoach need to follow people like Pleb uh, out there, who's the real source of information. Uh, you know, I'm obviously just an avid fan that got a bit of luck last year. But, uh, yeah, really, really enjoy being part of the community this year, guys. It's been great. He sells himself short every week, everyone. <laughs> Defending champ, signing out. Uh, and uh, if you want to follow me, NRL, Supercoach, All-Stars, been pretty quiet, um, and I did. For those that met, that do listen to my NRL show, uh, you'll know. I did say at the end I was taking a bit of a break because uh, pretty burnt out after the NRL season and um, the podcasting for that and everything. So uh, I'll, I'll ramp back up more with my activity and stuff, but that's why. Um, and also, I uh, it's hard to. I might have to create a new handle because I don't know about doing you know basketball and NRL under the one banner. Some people don't like that and unfollow and stuff and come back next year. Uh, but anyway. Um, make sure you jump on Discord, um, follow that. The uh, the community's going great. Uh, we're for the SC Hub. I think it's one of the top leagues that you can be in at the moment. So um, that's fantastic, and that just shows how great it is. And it's a great community where you can have uh, heaps of help and everything too. So I'm sure it'll be all flashing up now as far as following the socials. But until next week, uh, we'll have a new show for you. Good luck for the round with your trades, your decisions, and your captaincies. And we're back with SC Hub next round. See you, group.